G'day, you can all hear me okay? All good? Uh, my name's Dave uh, McDonald. I haven't been in this church for the last two weeks, uh, but I'm regularly here. I'm a pastor at, at this, this church and we were away uh, over the school holidays for a wedding for our son and uh, his wife. Who's, uh, she's actually in hospital at the moment um, in Indonesia. Um, so uh, if you're praying for them, might like to pray that um, she recovers. I think she ate something that didn't agree um, in um, Indonesia. And um, my wife isn't here this afternoon because she's gone down to Sydney um, because my son and his flatmate shared a, a flat in DY and she didn't trust the, our son's flatmate to clean it up before it became uh, the wedding nest. So she's gone down to clean it all up and fill the pantry and put stuff in the fridge and hopefully hide a lot of confetti. Um, that's my, uh, my plan. Um, we had a wedding yesterday, as you've heard. Uh, I was nearly the problem with the wedding. Uh, it was my job to marry the couple. And I can, I can admit to being a little flustered in the morning. There was a lot of things that weren't going the way they should have been going and uh, realised it at uh, a late stage that we were running late and so I raced into the service station, uh, saw the diesel, um, thought that I grabbed the right pump, put it in the car, uh, headed up the highway towards uh, Crescent Head and Fiona was driving and all of a sudden the car started to go poop, poop, poop and, um, and then it cut out and pulled over to the side. I've since actually got CCTV footage from the service station which showed me filling up my diesel Land Cruiser with the best quality unleaded fuel that uh, you can pay for. Uh, so it's, it's been uh, an interesting uh, couple of days. Um, we did get them married though. Uh, there was another hitch, that is um, I left my wedding notes at home but I wasn't feeling too bad about it because I had them on my phone but then when we pulled over and I realised it was me that had rung the NRMA, I said to Fiona, let's swap phones because they'll ring my phone. Uh, but they did get married. It, it all worked. Um, those of you who are there can testify to that. Um, that to say, you should really pray for your pastor um, at the moment, I think. Um, and pray that uh, as we look at this passage now, that uh, it'll be truthful, it'll be faithful and that God will encourage us through his word, because I think this is a really exciting part of God's word. Uh, so why don't you join with me as we pray now. Heavenly Father, please um, help me to be clear, help me to be focused on your word. Help us all to be attentive and, and for our hearts to be keen to hear what you've got to say to us. And we pray that you'll help us to see you more clearly uh, and to respond well. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, here's, a, here's a, a promo. If you miss sermons at SALT, you can get a podcast or you can watch it on our website. And uh, I've been doing that over the last couple of weeks. So I, I got to listen uh, to Nathan. I got to watch Nathan. And last week I heard him take you through the passage in chapter 32 about the golden calf. And it's, a, it's a pretty horrific incident. Uh, in the life of Israel. And uh, as I've reflected on this, I, I think it's important that we go back and we just recap a few things from chapter 32 to see God's response in chapters 33 and 34. See, what's going on with the building of a golden calf is in effect what it says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 23, they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal beings, birds, animals, and reptiles. Paul, when he's speaking about human rebellion against God, I think has the golden calf in mind, amongst other things, but I think it's there. Um, you see, in Romans 1 verse 23, it literally says that there are uh, people making images of the immortal God made to look like human beings, birds, tetrapods, and reptiles. Uh, it's not the only way to speak about animals. It's a four-footed animal. It's a calf. 
This is God's people turning their back upon him. It's no less than that. And another way to look at what's going on here is that it's an obscene adultery that Israel is committing. You see, God had entered into covenant with his people. The covenant language is that they will be his beloved possession. They will be precious to God. They will be his people and he will love his people. You see, it's, it's a marriage idea that's on view. And as you look through the scriptures, you will find the idea of God being a husband to his people. And Israel have committed adultery, spiritual adultery against God by worshipping a created thing instead of God himself. And if you want to see the extremity of this, I, I think kind of put it through a lens. How obnoxious is it for a husband to go home and find his wife in bed with another man? How obnoxious is it for a wife to go home and find her husband in bed with another woman? You kind of feel the sense of that? Let's make it a little more serious. That is, the husband goes away for a short time on the honeymoon, comes home, and the wife's in bed with another man. Because this is the honeymoon. God has just made this covenant with his people. And in a matter of days, they've turned against him. It's, it's extreme adultery. It's nothing less. This isn't just a, well, I like to worship God in my own way. This is turning your back on God and uniting yourself with things that have nothing to do with God whatsoever. It is serious. And we see the seriousness of it, I think, when we look at the way it gets described here. Back in, uh, in chapter 19 and chapter 20, as I said, we have this covenant imagery. And then in chapter 34 and verse 14, we have this. I don't know if you noticed it was the last verse that was read. Do not worship any other God for the Lord Yahweh, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Um, I reckon that if, without looking at this passage, I'd ask you to write down all the names of God that you could think of, none of you would have written down the word jealous. Except, of course, those of you who read it yesterday and were in pre -prepare, preparing for today and had got it. You see, it's not the way we think about God, is it? But it's this covenant idea. This is my beloved possession. This is a husband reaching out to his wife that he preciously loves and cares for. And it's right to be jealous for that love. Any husband who's not jealous for the love of his wife, any wife who's not jealous for the love of her husband, has not understood the nature of the covenant together. For it's to be forsaking all others as long as we both shall live. There's further implications. Um, that is what we saw just prior to the building of the golden calf were a whole set of instructions for the building of a tabernacle. Now, I don't know, maybe Nathan off tape said that, you know, Mac has given me a horrible job of doing all of these chapters and, and I've just got to go through all of this details. Of course I gave it to him. He's the carpenter, right? There's the building of the tabernacle. No, w what we're seeing here is is actually very significant because God is giving instructions for the building of a special tent where he will be present with his people. The key thing is that this is to be God's house. Of course, God dwells everywhere, but he will dwell especially with his treasured possession. And they will see that as they move from place to place with the tent, with this tabernacle. But now look at the response that comes after the golden calf incident. Um, at the beginning of chapter 33, the, the Lord said to Moses, leave this place, you and the people brought that 
and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go to the land I promised on oath to Abraham and so on. And then down in verse 3, he says, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. All sounds good, but I will not go with you because you are stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. What's going on? I mean, God is saying, yep, okay, because you rebelled against me, I'm still going to relent and let you go to the promised land, but you'll be on your own. I'm not going to go with you. Now, many people, I think, would go, oh, good. <laughs> I, I get the blessings of God, but I don't have to put up with God. But that's not the way Israel sees it. Look at verse 4. When the people heard this, they were distressed. They, they hear these distressing words and they begin to mourn and, and no one puts on any ornaments. For the Lord has said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff-necked people. If I go with you for even a moment, I might destroy you. Now, God is saying, yes, they're, they're going to get to the promised land, but um, he's not going to go with them. And uh, you see a number of interchanges that take place. Um, there's a little interlude here with Moses who goes to a particular tent and, uh, and God meets with him and the people see this taking place. And then I'll pick it up again down in verse 14. Um, Moses reminds God that this nation is his people. Uh, and the Lord replies to him in verse 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now, what you won't appreciate just from hearing that read in English is that there's something quite specific happening. Let, let me point this out. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. The you is singular. The you is Moses. So God said, I, I'll let the people go up to the promised land, but I won't go with them. Now he's saying to Moses, my presence will go with you and you alone. And I will give you rest. And then listen to Moses' response. If your presence does not go with us, okay, if it doesn't go with us, so you've got single, now plural, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the people on the face of the earth? And then the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Just as we saw last week, Moses intercedes for the people. Moses won't accept the blessing of God on his own, he is asking God to actually bless his treasured possession and go up with the people. He's interceding for those around him. And then he says in verse 18, now show me your glory. Well, I want to have a look at what is going on when Moses ask God to show him his glory. And um, we're going to focus on two verses, but just leading up to this, first of all, what would Moses expect when God says, when he asks God to show him his glory? What, what would he be anticipating, do you think? Well, look at God's reply in verse 19. And the Lord says, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. I'd imagine, as I read this, that maybe Moses was anticipating that he would get to see God. Show me your glory. And God says, well, I'm going to cause my goodness to go in front of you. The response is not to show him something, but to reveal his character, his goodness, and his name. And, and we see the character in his name. I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, compassion on whom I'll have compassion, but you can't see my face. 
And then you get this little interlude where the Lord says to him, there's a place where you can stand on a rock and when my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by and then I'll remove my hand and you'll be able to see my back but my face cannot be seen. Now it's all pretty unusual kind of stuff but um, it's, it's Moses being protected and sheltered by God because he cannot come face to face with God and live because of his sinfulness and God's holiness. But when God shows his glory to Moses, he reveals his character in words. That's his response. And at the heart of this, we have these famous words down in verses 6 and 7. And I've printed them for you on the handout. You might like to look at that. And I've printed them in a different translation. Uh, mainly I use the New International Version but I have plenty of different English versions at home and uh, if you've got U version on your phone then you've got any version that you could possibly read. Um, the, I printed it out here and I'll explain why when you see the translation from the Christian Standard Bible which is a, a highly respected um, in fact, they take the high ground and they call it an optimal equivalence translation. Um, they think they've got a pretty good translation, and I think they do as well. It's a very good translation, and it's quite a recent one. Um, let me point out why I have opted for this. The Lord passed in front of him, that is Moses, and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion and sin, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. The reason I've opted for that is because it says a thousand generations and it says a third and fourth generation. Whereas the NIV says two thousands and to the third and fourth generation. In the original, the word generation is not there. And I take it because you've got this contrast and compare going on, you either go with thousands and third and fourths, or you go with thousand generations and third and fourth generations. Because that's the way this is working. And I think it, it helps us to see this as a contrast in the extreme. I'll come to that in a minute. We'll work through this fairly quickly now. So God's name, the Lord, the Lord, it gets repeated. Um, it's repeated for emphasis. It's repeated to unpack what the Lord means. Of course, we've seen back in chapter 3 that it means Yahweh, and Yahweh refers to I am who I am, I will be who I will be. This is God being himself to the people. But something of his character is unpacked here. In fact, extraordinary things about his character. That he's compassionate and gracious. I mean, we've seen that already. The, the people of Israel grumbling and complaining, turning their backs. And we see it here at this time because after the golden calf incident, God had said, well, I'm not going to go with them anymore. And Moses pleads for them and God relents. And so his compassion and his grace are at the fore. The people don't deserve to enter into the promised land. God's not taking them in because they're the best people he could find on the whole planet. To the contrary, that only takes them a matter of days till they turn their back on God in, a, in an extreme, debauched manner. But God is compassionate and gracious. And he is slow to anger. I know that some people have a problem when they hear about God being angry. But, but hear it as being slow to anger. One of the things that I've discovered about myself, especially over the last 10 years, is that under certain circumstances, I can be quick to anger. There are things that will fire me up and I'll lose my temper and I'm not proud of it. And it causes relational damage and it's destructive. And it's, it's appalling, really. 
But if I think that God's anger is anything like that, then I have not looked at the God of the Bible. Because God's anger is righteous and true, and he is slow to bring it about. God is patient. He waits. He responds accordingly, tempered with compassion and with grace and abounding in love and faithfulness. In the original, it's literally abounding in hesed, meaning faithful love. It's a beautiful kind of love. That is, it's consistent. It's reliable. It's always God-initiated in Scripture. God is the one who is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in faithful love. That's who he is. That's the Lord. When Moses says, Lord, show me your glory, he gets it. Spoken to him. The character of God. Surely, as you think about how God is to Moses and has been to the people, you see this one, compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in hesed, in love and faithfulness. And then you see the actions that flow from this. Maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. I've gone back to the NIV there and I'll contrast this in just a second. Maintaining faithful love is what he does. Um, it, it's part of the character of God in his name that he'll be like this. And therefore it flows out in the way that he treats the people faithfully loving them and the expression of it that's highlighted here is forgiveness forgiving notice iniquity rebellion and sin three slightly different words for rebellion against god three slightly different words for evil for wickedness for disobedience here are the people who in chapter 32 were guilty of iniquity and rebellion and sin. And God forgives that. That's the character of who God is. He shows forgiveness to thousands. No, I think it's to thousands of generations. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. I know again that some people have found those verses problemsome. Why would God punish the children for their fathers and their grandfathers and their great-grandfathers' sin? Well, a couple of things to point out. One is, it says he doesn't leave the guilty unpunished, but then it's actually bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children. It's not punishing the children for the father's sin. Um, some of the translations, I think the ESV, have visiting the sins of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Think about it. The adult Israelites turn their back upon God. They worship an idol. They, they party in debauched revelry. Is that not going to impact the kids and the grandkids? and the great grandkids and if people turn their back upon God and they shut God out of their lives and they live as though there is no God and God has no place in their lives no voice about God in their home what's going to happen with the children and their children and their children see that God visits the the sin of the parents on the children and their children and so on it, it's it's the consequence of rebellion against God, and we see that at work. But again, I don't think that's the main point of what's being said here. I think the main point is that God will forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin, but he will do so without leaving the guilty unpunished. And that is a conundrum. Which is it? Is he punishing them? Or is he forgiving them? And the answer of scripture is yes. But hang on, is it punishment or is it forgiveness? Yes. 
says attention. And I think if we can read these verses without seeing the tension, then we need to read them again. Because it's not talking about different people. Ultimately, everybody is guilty of sin. And if God must punish all sin, then everybody must be punished. And the only people that can be forgiven are sinful people. You don't have to forgive somebody who's not sinful. And so you've got sinful people being punished and sinful people being forgiven. Which is it? And I think we are intended to see the tension. It's a, it's a problem. How's it going to work out? Moses raised the problem back earlier in the passage I think we looked at last week where he talked about making atonement for the sin of the people. Is there going to be a way that this can be done? I think we're intended to see that, that there is not balance here or the balance is really out of step. That is, if you want to think about forgiveness, then think in terms of thousands. If you want to think in terms of punishment, think in terms of three and fours. That is, there's a waiting that goes on here. What, what is the easy thing to do? Well, the easy thing is to punish. What is the hard thing to do? Well, massively difficult to forgive. But again, can you really forgive if you're supposed to punish? Does this mean that God is acting unjustly? Well, there's the tension, there's the imbalance, and we need to look to the resolution. And of course, the resolution is ultimately only to be found in one place, and that is in one man. And that is a man who came into our world and was known as Jesus. The word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. The word became grace and truth, both end. And this word of God that be, became human, that reveals the truth and the grace of God, is punished for our sin so that we can be forgiven. There's no other way. There's nothing else that resolves the tension. God can show himself to be just by having sin punished, but by taking it himself in Jesus, he can be both just and the one who shows mercy to people who are guilty. That's why we call it Good Friday. There's nothing better than that that we can be forgiven because of Christ. And, and of course, the imagery that, that we're going to sing in just a minute, the rock of ages. How is it that, that ultimately we can be protected from the glory of God destroying us? It's by being hidden in the cleft of the rock, and that rock is Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus that we find protection from being burned up by God's glory. And that protection comes by Jesus being punished in our place, taking the anger that we deserve. What a wonderful saviour we have. And so, friends, I want to encourage us to meditate on these verses. One of the reasons I've, I've printed them out for us is um, that they just warrant our continual reading and attention. In fact, if you're the kind of person like me who colours in your Bible, these would be great verses to highlight, um, to write them out perhaps for yourself, to put them in a place where you could memorise them, to see that this is your God and to ask God to show you his glory. And if you ask God to show you his glory, then these chapters suggest that God will point to his character and how his character has been revealed fully and completely in Jesus Christ for you. And if you want to read further on this, I encourage you to, to go to 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4 because 
the, the section that I haven't got to where Moses meets with God and he comes back and he's, he, he puts a veil over his face because he's radiant, gets picked up by the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 as a way of saying, well, we've got something far better than what Moses had. Because in Jesus, we can come before God with unveiled faces. We can see God as he is. We can come into his presence. We don't have to fear God because God has taken the punishment on himself in Christ. What a glorious God, hey? Let's thank him. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you made yourself known to Moses and that Moses has recorded this for us to know you as well. Please help us to see you as you are and to, to wonder at this, to delight in this, to act on the basis of this. We thank you, Father, that you've made yourself known in Jesus, that in Jesus we see the fullness of your glory, the fullness of your character. We see your mercy, we see your compassion, where you don't leave the guilty unpunished, but you show forgiveness to thousands of generations. Amen.